Morning, Chris. Hello, <laughs> morning, Marianne. How many years ago were you a journalist working at the, the Star and various other newspapers? I started um, in 1980, then I left uh, mainstream journalism in 1997. So also, just you had enough of it. Was it just? It had been a very, I think, uh, tumultuous, you know, epoch for you as a journalist. You had to leave the country. You were naming death squads. So when did you decide enough? I think I'd, I, I'd reached a saturation point in the sense that I felt I just had enough of seeing people at their worst. Around about 1997? 97. So you went off and did something else and then this bookshop became part of something you were doing in Hermanus. Well, I, I came to Hermanus to be a recluse. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we all know how that yes. has turned out. Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, unfortunately, I found you um, <laughs> a little while later because um, I had been called by the publishers who had received a manuscript from a guy called Mark Minnie who was living in China and teaching and they wanted me to have a look at this manuscript because for them it was quite something. So I get this thing and I read it and it's in his particular language, very Elmore Leonard style of writing. But I understand immediately when I read the story what it is about. And I say to the publishers, I know Chris Stain. Uh, tell us a bit about your involvement with investigating the original whole issue around the Bird Island Boys, the death of Dave Allen and John Wiley, and the potential then for this to be connected to a wider political network at the time. Mm. So you wrote those original stories, I remember. I think we were together at the Cape yes, Times. Yes, yes. Um, not in the same department. And uh, I don't think I even covered his suicide. He was standing for uh, re-election, uh, and, and he was uh, bound to, to win that seat again. Uh, so it was on the eve of an election. I don't think I covered his, his apparent suicide because I, I may have been off that day. But then I got a call, uh, a tip off from, Johann from somebody in Johannesburg, uh, telling me to look at a link between his apparent suicide and the apparent suicide of a man called Dave Allen in Port Elizabeth. Uh, I started doing so, and um, one of the people I called for information was Dave Allen's brother. Jeffrey Allen, who worked with me on the Rand Daily Mail, mm. and who was a brilliant investigative journalist, and who um, who didn't allow people to keep secrets from him. So, who, and he obviously knew his brother's secrets. Uh, he, what he told me, sent me to PE uh, because he told me about uh, Magnus Wiley. Uh, he, he told me that John had been in a relationship with his brother. Uh, John Wiley had been in a relationship with his brother. Uh, he told me about trips to the island involving Magnus, Wiley and, and others. What did you think when he told you that? Of course, at the time, Magnus Malan was the second most powerful man in South Africa. He was the commander in chief of the armed forces. He uh, was trusted by South Africans to take care of uh, the white minority. He was the man who was seeing off young boys to the border to fight wars. So he was a very iconic figure in apartheid South Africa and a man that in many ways was untouchable. Well, I, I, if it had been anybody else, I would just have laughed and not believed it. But because it was Jeff Allen, I, I, I had to seriously consider what he had to say because I knew um, how good he was at his job. And, and, and why would he say something that damaging and damning about his own brother? But as he put it to me, he had to take the fall. My brother had to take the fall for his cabinet colleagues. And I, I, I felt that he, they, there was an, a, an element of, of revenge mm -hmm. because his brother had died. Um, Right. Because of, 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 of what of, was seething underneath and But at the that. same time, he was prepared to expose the corruption involving his brother and, 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 right. uh, and John Right. So that's White. what draws you into the story. Absolutely. You, you go off, uh, uh, you drive eventually. off to, eventually. You, you manage to get the Cape Times to allow you to go <laughs> because in those days it wasn't easy. No. And for three whole days. For three whole days. <laughs> but in the meantime, what's happened is this man, Mark Minnie, whose manuscript yeah. I get 30 years yes. later, uh, it, it, he was an undercover narcotics uh, cop in, in PE, a uh, working class guy, um, working not in a special branch. And this investigation comes to him by accident through a woman who comes to his office one day. So you go there and you try to meet with Mark Minnie because you hear he's the investigating officer. Um, I, I went to meet with other people. Uh, 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 people had given me names of people to meet with in Port Elizabeth. And one was somebody um, who was uh, high up in the National Party and uh, related, um, his wife was related to a cabinet minister. He, uh, he was in the fishing industry. Um, and uh, he, he, um, he had the most damning information according to my sources. I met with him and according to him, um, uh, a young boy 
uh, had been shot on the island, ended up in hospital in a critical condition, uh, had an emergency operation, family was paid off, um, uh, and uh, according to him, uh, some, of, some of the events on the island uh, were witnessed by uh, one of the lighthouse caretakers, uh, who wasn't as drunk as they thought he was, and was not beyond leopard crawling to go and spy on people. Uh, and so using there, were lots of, there were lots of witnesses to uh, this. Uh, uh, and, uh, this, and was a, and this was a national party. It was a national deep party, throat. deep throat. But then let's just add here that people like Martin Wells, who's now the editor of Noseweek, yeah. and m various other journalists then go to PE and try to investigate, but they all either get told get off the investigation. In the meantime, what's happening with Mark Milley, you don't know at this point because you're a journalist. No, but I'm not yet. I you're starting to find that editors are questioning you, you the investigation is, is, is being uh, scoured of the detail, and Mark is finding the same thing. He's finding a lot of pushback around what he's busy trying to investigate in, in PE. So ultimately, the story that you write and that appears in the Cape Times is watered down. Well, I, uh, before I left Pia, let me add, I finally did decide to make contact with, yes, with, with Mark. Mark. I think I had literally had to call the police station and say, who's investigating this case? Because in those days, you could not speak to a, a policeman directly. You had to go through a spokesperson who would sanitize the version uh, you were supposed to get. Uh, and, and he agreed to meet me in the foyer of hotel. Um, uh, I had forgotten about that meeting because it was useless for me. Uh, in terms of what I could write, because it was an off-record meeting. But, but the way Mark recalled it was that I, um, I, I shared with him what my deep throat had told me, and that he had said that Cabinet knew. And uh, we don't mention John Wiley, and, and, and um, he confirmed it off-record. Um, and then he, um, but when I got to Magnus Milan, he, f he freaked out completely uh, and, and told me, fuck off you bitch, you're going to get me killed. He distrusted me, he didn't know whether I was there to kill him, <laughs> or, or uh, what was, uh, uh, he thought, I'm, uh, he, he didn't know how to handle it, but the, these words, fuck off you bitch, you're going to get me killed. And, and I, for me, when I think of the story, I often think of these two moments. The first time, he told me, fuck off you bitch, you're going to get me killed. The second time, I stood next to his body, 31 years later. So and I could hear him say that. Could, I could hear him turn mm. to me and say, I told you so. Let's talk about then how your life changes, you get out of investigative journalism, you come here to Hermanus, and you run this bookshop and you get away from journalism and you do other things. I mean, the question then is, do, do you regret, in a sense, being flung back into a world and a universe that you'd left in the 1980s? Apartheid South Africa, death squads, killer cops, lawlessness. Um, you know, these, these dark clouds that existed then over your head as a journalist and now you step back into it 31 years later. Here it is again. No, I don't regret it. I absolutely don't. I don't think I ever will. I, um, I'm not continuing this because Mark asked me to. I'm continuing with this because th that is all, that's the only thing to do. It's the right thing to do. You don't question uh, your... Uh, you don't question something because it causes you discomfort. Uh, I, um, I, this is our last chance. Because you'd written about this in your own book, Publish yes. and Be Damned. Yes. And it seemed to have just gone under the radar because South African political news yes. cycle is insane and all sorts of other mm. things have happened and everybody just thought it would just go away, it yes. would just dissipate. But it didn't, you know. Yes. So you'd almost put it in the book and left it there. But it was waiting to be reopened again because the implications of the allegations and what was found and the evidence that exists are so shattering to the idea of the past um, that it's a very dangerous playground to be playing in, as you've noticed since publishing the book. I think the, the cover-up is continuing uh, 31 years later uh, in, because not all the perpetrators are dead and um, not all the victims are dead. And not all the people who have knowledge of what happened are dead. And uh, I've said it uh, repeatedly that the, the, the uproar uh, is not about what's in the book. There is very little in the book. We made that clear. It's about what still has to be uncovered or what still has to be revealed. And if a book can be discredited now, if Mark can be discredited, if I can be discredited, then future revelations will not be believed. And that is what people are fighting for. They are fighting for future. They are fighting to ensure that future revelations will not be believed. I cannot back down. I will not back down. This is our last chance for justice. 
So in a sense, what is incredible is that you've managed to have an investigation reopened, that, that uh, we have Brigadier Sonia Harry, who is, people might not know, but she is one of the, one of the country's top cops who helped solve the Anine Boyson's uh, case. She's, very, she's not in the public eye, and she quietly goes on and does her work. She's hugely respected by her colleagues, and they have a formal investigation has been registered, I take it. Um, uh, uh, there has been uh, an unofficial inquiry since uh, September 6, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I never thought I would see the day uh, that this would be properly investigated. That was all Mark ever wanted. That was all anybody ever wanted who was not on the wrong side of the story. Uh, I, for the first time, I have put my faith in the police. Uh, for, the, for the first time in my entire career, I've put my face in the police. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I'm now the police informer I never was. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm putting my, I, I'm not working on a second book. I've sacrificed a second book in order to give whatever information I get to the police. Because um, justice is more important than book sales. Mm. Have, and have people come forward that, that are, uh, and, and, and what has happened in the aftermath? Because I, I think there's been you, a pushback uh, against the book. I mean, there's been major stories in the Afrikaans newspapers, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, confirming that P.W. Boerter himself asked for the docket, which, yes. you know, so um, people took Mark's text and your text and singled out people named in those in the book and went to speak to them. And it was confirmed that, in yes. fact, the docket was taken from Mark's office. Yes. Um, this is an old story. Uh, it's not something Mark, uh, you and I, uh, sat and cooked up in, 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 a, in a back room two years ago. And even people who are, who, who, who are attacking us are people who knew about it all those years ago. Uh, I think some people are, some people, uh, are fighting, um, fighting the truth because they don't want to be uh, revealed as having that knowledge because knowledge is culpability. Knowledge is accountability. Um, once, the, the, once you had completed your manuscript and Mark had completed his manuscript, I needed to write, or I was asked by the publisher mm -hmm. to write forward because um, we needed to sort of contain this within mm -hmm. the contemporary context. And what was the most difficult to do was understand the depth and the nature of these child abuse paedophilic rings that exist globally. Um, and I think it was hard for people. That's part of what we're having in terms of the resistance mm -hmm. to the story, that this cadre of leadership of the National Party somehow had been involved um, with pedophilia and abusing young uh, black men or colored men or white guys as well, sort of vulnerable children were, were mm. raked, raked into a net or, or of, of, of these men. And I think that's something people can't face mm. in a way. Um, and that's also been part of the kickback. Would you say that? It's been part of the um, unable to believe that this is actually possible. Yes, I, 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 agree with, I agree with you, but you, I think you know, um, I keep you in the loop, you know, you know what information's come in. Um, we know how strong the story really is um, and how, how much stronger it has become since the publication of the book, which it, we would never have had all this information if we didn't publish the book. It was just one of those, those things, but I agree with you. And when people uh, uh, deny that this has happened, you have to uh, uh, ask them now, on what basis? Are you denying this? Because you were not on the island. Well, people say there is no proof in the book. There is no evidence that Magnus Malan was involved. There is no uh, concrete. Well, I keep saying to them, yes, well, the docket was stolen. So, I mean, that's how, that's why a docket gets stolen, so that there is no evidence. I think that, that, that um, the, peop uh, the, the people who are denying, the, the biggest deniers of the story are people who have absolutely uh, no evidence for that for those to back up those denials absolutely no evidence because they would have had to be on the island or they would have had to be in a house or they would have had to be in a hotel or they would have had to be in a room uh, and they uh, to issue that denial mm -hmm. they would have had to witness what was not happening to issue a denial like that and interesting and enough you were so caught up in that story that you own not only that you kept your notes from the 80s, years ago. When, uh, when in actual fact you, uh, you did tell the editor of the Cape Times that the boy had been injured and in fact we used to print out our stories then before we sent them and I don't think people count on the fact that you are unlike me, I, don't, I keep notes but not in the organized way you do. You were able to take out those notes again and show that you indeed did, did tell the editor that the young man or the boy had been wounded and hurt. You contacted the doctor. So you immersed yourself in finding people 
who were able to corroborate um, this sprawling story that people were trying to cover up as they went along. And you were able to do that, and you're continuing to do that. I mean, uh, it seems like what, what turned out to be Mark's need to write this book has now flipped back into your space as something you need to finish. Absolutely. It's a story that, that's, that, I, I, a story that I have to finish. Uh, and I, I, I still have a long way to go. And I don't believe the last chapter is going to be the, the police arresting me for wasting their time. Uh, I don't intend for that to happen. I think you know that I've worked on this almost every day since the book uh, was published. And, and you know uh, that we, we're still getting in new information. And you still, uh, I think the biggest breakthrough came uh, only two weeks ago. Uh, so, um, uh, And you're sharing all of that with, with, with Brigadier Hari. So as people come to you and approach you, you send on to her and she goes and investigates. Absolutely. So. I, instead of leaking the information to the media or giving it to you to write a juicy story, mm. I, I, I keep it to myself. I, I ask the source for permission to share his or her identity with Brigadier Hari. I wait for that permission. I forward her the information. I don't give, I try not to give her any leads without a source, a contactable source with an a name, address, or so a telephone number. What is the number. pushback against the book? What is the, it seems to be a concerted effort to try and discredit Mark and discredit you um, for a book that, as you say, doesn't have very much in it except Mark's story and your story. Absolutely. I, I think a Mark, Mark is a soft target because he was a controversial cop. Uh, but Mark uh, was, d did not paint himself as anything other than that. Uh, he was very honest about his own failings, about his own shortcomings, about being going rogue towards the end. Uh, and he was upset with Tafelberg for not fitting more of that into the book. He, was, uh, he wanted to to, he wanted to, to be the raw him, and, and, and whatever people say about Mark uh, uh, has to be seen in the light of, of, of who he was, an undercover cop in the 80s, English speaking, by the way. From a, from a very, very um, difficult background, from a very, very abusive a rape background. Victim. And, a, and a rape victim himself, not, a rape survivor himself. It's not, um, he writes about the twins, um, and uh, somebody was saying, no, the twins would not have raped him, he was too ugly. Uh, and interesting, I think, that was also picked up that, that uh, Mark's ability to mm -hmm. empathize with the boys who mm -hmm. were abused comes from his own understanding of what it means to be abused by He was adults. repeatedly raped, yeah. uh, as you know, and, and, and he was tortured, he was anxious, he was a warrior, uh, and um, it would have been easy to push Mark over the edge towards the end. The story was out, it was a catharsis. Uh, as he said to me uh, one day, um, after the movie rights were sold, because I told him, oh, you have unrealistic expectations of this book. Nobody's going to buy the movie rights, and, and somebody did. And 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 I, and, and he, I, and he, uh, he wanted me to have a bigger share of the royalties because I, I'm taking a smaller, small share. And 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 I said no. Uh, he said, "Fuck the money. The story is out." When I met him, what was mm -hmm. so interesting as well was that he had. He had felt that he that that um, he had accomplished something by writing this, and mm -hmm. he was also very. He wanted his children to be proud of him. He mm -hmm. spoke a lot about his children, and I think that what he was most afraid of putting in the book was not the allegations that he uh, found mm -hmm. out or the investigation that he did that led him to Magnus's door, but was the fact that he had been raped himself, that he'd been abused himself, and the effect of that on his he life. He still felt ashamed. Um, he felt ashamed about it, and that was what he was most afraid of in the book, not not the stuff which exposed people who could possibly threaten him in the end. So Mark is dead now, Chris. Mark is dead. The author you and I worked with no longer exists. I mean, it was, it was in, unbelievably traumatic for us to find out that he died through an apparent suicide. And you got, you'd, you'd seen much more of him than I did. Um, the other day, I read an email he wrote the day before he died, I think. He wrote it about lunchtime. And he said, there are some military people looking for me. Um, so whatever happened in those last days, um, it was, uh, I believe he was remotely murdered. I believe uh, they made him do their dirty work. Which, which was the case also one felt in the other, at least one other suicide, mm. uh, the Dave Allen suicide. 
which is which which yes. still has questions around it. And the John Wiley is much more, less so because PW did phone John Wiley and have a two-hour conversation with him after he'd got the docket. But if you look at all discrepancies, all the discrepancies there. I remember, the room was locked. The key wasn't found. Uh, uh, the, uh, his son had to get in through a window. I suspected from the start that that Wally's suicide was murder. So you've planned now to not run this bookshop anymore and to step back into a world which, as you and I know, I'm less inclined than you are. I find, you know, people who live in this underworld very difficult to be around. Um, very difficult to engage with. Also very difficult to go back into apartheid South Africa with these death squads who burnt people, who killed people, who tortured people, who had combis that drove around and pick up. There's a depravity to the lawlessness of it, which, you know, uh, when one steps back into it is quite triggering in a way. But you prepared to go back there again after having been out of it and having this bookstore to run? Um, Absolutely. I, I, that is, that's, uh, there's no question about it. I. Uh, I could not live with myself if I did not do that. Um, I, I, it's, it's actually not even a question, I have to tell you, because there is no choice. The, uh, you, you can't, I can't even begin to debate it with myself. That it's, there's just one, one thing to do. So Chris, you've stepped back into this thing, uh, away from your bookstore. Um, there's still so many unanswered questions around this investigation, uh, and some of those answers are coming to the fore. When is this over for you? This is not for me. This is not to, to clear my name. I know what I am. I'm a journalist who's never had to publish a correction to a story. Why would I make up anything? Uh, people made allegations. I um, reported those allegations accurately. I did a simple journalism job. There was no room for a lie. So. I don't want to vindicate myself. I want the case properly investigated, and that's what's happening. And those boys who and I don't were think used they and, were and left to live lives, shattered lives and, afterwards. And uh, just the other day, I, 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 I found out what had become of one of them. And it's not a pretty story, as you well know. And, and uh, no, somebody has to account for that. So once this is over, or when it's over, are you going to leave journalism again because you keep getting pulled in um, and go back to being in the bookstore? Uh, or is it too early to tell what you're going to be doing after this? Because you have these skills and the history and the institutional memory um, that is vital to, I suppose, keeping the past in the present and showing that, that whatever moved there in, in, in the shadows still moves now in the shadows all over. I feel, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm back in the 80s. and, and, and uh, However far we think we've come, we have not. Uh, so much of, of us is, still lives in the past. And, and we need to un uncover and unearth more of these hidden parts of our past um, for us to be able to move forward. And it also seems that the publication of the book, particularly in, in democratic South Africa, has allowed people um, to see some light in this tunnel and they've all come forward with information and they're connecting with you about that. People have come to regard me as somebody who is serious about taking this forward. So people are sending me good information. People are sending me things that have been missing for 21, for 20 years. People are sending me files. People are sending me documents. People are sending me photographs. People are, are, are dusting off things that have been buried for a long time. We are making slow progress. So I'm going forward. I don't know. Um, so I'm looking at, at, a few, at, at another couple of years, working on another case, because that is, that is the right thing to do. That's what you do. Yeah, that's, what, that I'm, that's me. That's you. Um, Chris, thank you very much for speaking to, to us about this and for honouring Mark and honouring uh, the, the victims, some of them who did not survive, and searching for the truth, whatever that is in the end. So thank you very much. Well, and thank uh, you for, 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 for running the race with me. <laughs> Thank you for being my partner. God help it. Yeah. God help it. This is Thanks who we are. Thank you.